So they asked me to talk a little bit about you know, what I know about grazing cropland. And I'd given a similar talk in North Carolina uh, to some folks, and, and I'm treating it today a little bit the same way. For those of you from Oklahoma, I apologize because, you know, this first few slides you're going to know a lot about. But uh, Oklahoma, of course, like most of the Southern Plains, got a lot of diversity, and, and these two maps explain a lot of the reason why. Uh, just the rainfall and evapotranspiration gradient from east to west, and then, of course, there's a tremendous diversity in our soils and the productivity of the soils. And uh, <clears throat> over time, you know, uh, we kind of settled on wheat. So we're a large producer of wheat. And one of the reasons why is because of its dual purpose nature as far as um, utilizing the excess forage in the winter. And uh, the reason that is, of course, it provides us this dual purpose crop. We can, we can cut it for grain. And in that case, we want to see it planted in October. And if, it's, uh, if we want to graze it, we're going to plant it in September. And we can graze it out or we can uh, pull the cattle off prior to hauler stem and uh, get a grain crop off of it. And uh, some of the, the varieties as a result of, of, of this system, we've got Duster and, and Gallagher and, <clears throat> and some of these varieties that are good grazing wheats. And if you're interested in that kind of stuff, uh, you can look at this fact sheet. And I'm sharing a lot of things that, you know, I don't do specifically, but the people in our department do. And we have a, an excellent wheat improvement team. And it's fairly uh, unique in the world in that they focus both on the grain quality yield as well as the forage productivity of our wheats. Um, <clears throat> and so a little history. This is um, our planted and, and harvested acres of wheat. And this kind of tells the story of our grazing wheat system in that we we seldom harvest more than you know 60 70 percent of our wheat crop that's planted and some of that of course due to localized failures and things like that but a great deal of the two million acres that's not harvested um, is going to be grazed out and um, on the dual purpose side of things this is just a quick um, slide and if, for those of you who are not familiar with this, uh, you can look at these fact sheets uh, from Ag Econ and the Plant and Soil Science Department of Oklahoma State University. And essentially what they found when looking at all the data that we have over the years is that September planted wheat, we're gonna tend to yield about 7% 7, 7 lower than October planted wheat. And that's just purely the planting date influence on wheat yield, grain yield. And then if we graze it to first hollow stem, <clears throat> we can expect an average over time of about a 7% yield loss on the grain side. And, but we can, um, we can expect an average daily gain of two, two pounds per day. So that yield loss from the early planting and grazing, uh, we, we, the, our ag economists have done a nice job of, help, of developing products and, and, uh, and tools to determine based on beef prices, wheat prices, and costs, uh, what the best scenario might be. And so I won't get into that, but that, that information is available. If you contact me, I can put you in, in touch with that information. Um, one of the things that I work on is some of the challenges with wheat in our no-till systems. <clears throat> you know, my job is to, I tell people, my primary job is to help growers minimize the amount of dirt blowing around in the air through wind erosion and running downstream through water erosion. And so my interest in, in, or at least my function, is to try to help producers find profitable ways of getting that done. And one of the challenges with, with this wheat grazing system is that it's a monoculture and it can become very challenging to control weeds and pests and things. Um, and so we're trying to look at uh, rotational uh, options for, for these growers that are heavily um, influenced by their forage production needs. Um, so um, many more concerned with reduced forage base if we rotate. So if we go to a grain crop, then what are we going to do for forage? And, and so um, a lot of these guys have been, uh, and, and they live in a world where they break even on grain and make a living on the cattle. <clears throat> and that's something that's commonly said in Oklahoma on the dual purpose wheat. So now we're looking at alternative grazing programs and one way to look at that is just kind of look around the country and see what uh, producers are doing. And I'm gonna share some examples of what I see in Oklahoma 
Um, but this alternative grazing um, that's uh, come um, really to a forefront in the Southern Plains uh, on cropland is probably one of the most useful and exciting parts of the soil health initiative. That's what I'm most excited about. And the realization that, that we can develop diverse rotations based on forage cropping systems. You know, there for a while we were trying to figure out what kind of grain crop rotations we could do. And now I think it's, we're better suited on, on some of these forage rotations in some parts of Oklahoma. Um, uh, but, but at the same time, I don't think we can treat them like, like they treat them in other parts of the country. I would say, you know, when we're looking at summer crop production, grain crop production, we want as much residue as we can get. But then we start looking at fields where we're planting like small grains in the fall. We need to either adjust our planting date or the way we plant uh, or the way we fertilize to, to overcome some of these high residue conditions that we might want to be planting wheat into. So what I'm telling you is my observations and experiences with growing wheat for forage production in the fall is that and the more residue is not always better. And we are starting to try to look at some of that, but we haven't got a lot of data on that, but I'll share what I have. And particularly true, like I say, for fall forages, <clears throat> when we plant fall forages, we're, we're wanting to grow forage before it gets too cold for that wheat crop to grow. So we want it to come out of the grass or out of the ground fast and grow quickly. And then uh, we can kick our cattle out in December. And, and when we're planting into heavy residue, that fall forage production is oftentimes uh, reduced. But we have data that shows that in the spring, we can compensate for that. And I think that's because that heavy residue load or that higher residue load will conserve moisture and allow it to grow um, uh, more effectively in the spring, particularly if we have drought conditions. So there's give and take and we have to realize all that when we're looking at uh, uh, and experiencing some of these things. And uh, we're still, like I say, improving some of that or evaluating and trying to learn some of that. Um, but to start off with some examples, um, we, we have, and here I'm just going to highlight where these farms are. And one farm I, I, I go and I learn a lot from this producer is in central Oklahoma where he's using continuous graze out with a summer cover. And um, <clears throat> what he's doing is he's grazing wheat or triticale or rye or barley or oats or a mixture of them. And he's grazing it hard with a lot of beef and he's taking a lot of beef off in gain. <clears throat> and then he may come along in the spring after his graze out and have a lot of bare ground. So then, then he'll come back in with a cover crop. And I, the reason I like this one, and it's hard for us to do research on this, and we, we have some experience at OSU on this, but the challenge is, is I'm a, a soil scientist in a plant soil science department, so I have to have my animal scientists uh, work with me, which they do. Um, and we'll discuss some of that work here in a few slides. But this system is very interesting because we can graze that out and we can terminate the wheat crop and we can get these covers in earlier and we can kill them earlier and then give us time to get back to the cool season forage. This individual, you know, he'll pull cattle off in mid to early May, kill it and plant these covers if, if uh, he's taken too much residue off with the beef and then he'll kill them in, in mid, mid to late July, and then his drill is running with uh, small grains back the last week of August or so. And it's really hot, and it's, it's very interesting that he can get away with this because the late August is really hot, but I think the way he can get away with it is he's got plenty of residue, and that's why I say we can deal with residue, but if we have high residue in, in conditions, we're going to need to plant earlier so that we can offset the... Uh, the influences that that heavy residue has on the rate of growth on the small grains. Um, and this is just some pictures from this farm. When you look up here in this left-hand corner, <clears throat> I will tell you that I, as a soil scientist, can't see any evidence of cattle being on that soil. There, there's very little or no compaction. It's beautiful soil. It's one of the nicest soils I've seen. And that's a result of 20 years of, of, uh, of no-till and then the proper and thoughtful management of his grazing. And then you can see out here, he's got a, a pretty good number of, of cattle out on this wheat field. And what you're seeing is a wheat field with uh, carcasses of, of, uh, of sun hemp 
and sorghum sedan, I think. Um, I'm not a big fan personally of, of sun hemp because it's very challenging to kill, particularly when it's head high, shoulder high, anything over six inches tall chemically, um, I can't kill. And so I'm not a big fan of it, particularly when we start looking at some of these, these, uh, these varieties that they've bred to make seed in the United States. Because uh, if I can't kill it, I'm just, I get a little concerned about it being a weed. Now, he, his experience, this producer's experience is that he can knock all the leaves off of it and reduce its, um, its uh, water use by, by burning off all the leaves. And then by the time it starts to really uh, uh, recover from that, it'll freeze and die. Um, but, but there is some challenges. If you plant a full solid stand of sun hemp, just plan on not being able to kill it. Uh, with chemicals if it gets over six inches tall and then you know this is in some years down here in the right hand corner this is what his wheat fields could theoretically look like if he needs the forage he'll take it but then he'll regain that residue back with his cover crops and that's what keeps his soil uh, doing well I think um, continuous graze out with summer crabgrass this is something that's been going on in Oklahoma for a very long time um, I've I've been exposed to this since I was a kid and, and we do not have up until now much research outside of uh, the Noble Foundation. The, the Noble Foundation develops uh, uh, crabgrass varieties and does a good good job uh, working with crabgrass and other forages but we at OSU hadn't done a lot of work on it until recently but I know you know these stars just represent places where I know it's happening on farms and so the idea is, is that we're going to plant wheat, cereal rye, ryegrass, triticale. Um, you know, the ryegrass often comes in as a weed, and so we, we don't always have to plant that. But th they are managing that ryegrass in some of these systems with the crabgrass, and they're grazing in the summer and winter. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see people spray the, the crabgrass for broadleafs, the, the wheat and cereal grains for, for broadleafs to uh, optimize the grass forage production and even fertilize it. And then cattle on the crabgrass can, can graze. It kind of depends on what you want to do, but in, in Stillwater on OSU's um, deal, Animal Science, they, they, they generally graze it from mid to early June to the end of July, the first of August. And it, re it grossly reduces the seed cost compared to, you know, planting sorghum sedans or millets and things like that um, because it reseeds itself. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, here, this is our study in Stillwater. So this is where we're planting it. And you can see we've got a pretty good amount of residue from the crabgrass in this field. Um, and then down here on the right hand, that's the cows out on the crabgrass. And um, we're, we're, this year we did some work looking at residue um, cutting height. So we went in and artificially cut some of the crabgrass at different heights to see how that would affect the wheat. And I'll share you with that. Share that data with you later. Um, but we we this is we did this in such a way. We initiated this program in in a way that I would not recommend. We essentially went out. This is a field that has been grazed out for years by Animal Science and their research program, and cultivated through the summertime. And these soils. In going around the state, the, the, some of the roughest soils, the soils that have the least organic matter in them, for instance, and have the least structural character are these soils that are grazed out annually and then cultivated all summer and then planted back to wheat. And that's because they're removing all the surface residue and then uh, cultivating it and then planting back wheat. Even where we, we are great cultivating grain production ground, will have more organic matter because you got all that above ground biomass but when we're grazing it off and then cultivating it we're taking half of the organic matter um, produced from that wheat and taking it off in beef so so we've just got much less organic matter so these are pretty tough soils and we took and we grazed this out <coughs> and we just no-tilled sorghum sedan into it the first summer and it turned out pretty well and um, we haven't we haven't cultivated it since and I don't have a lot of experience with this field prior to us initiating the no-till, but everything seems to look pretty good. 
um, and the animal scientists um, tell me that the forage productivity is very comparable to what it was when it was cultivated. We don't have any cultivated um, treatments in here for checks, and that's because of challenges in, in replicating it and getting everything done. But this is 90 acres of, of continuous no-till that's grazed for about nine months out of the year. Um, and then that brings us, and we'll come back to that, um, but I want to go on to this grazing summer cover crops between wheat crops. Um, it's a great deal of interest in this particular program, and a lot of folks are trying it. Um, again, we did that one summer in Stillwater, but my animal science colleagues, David Lawman and uh, um, yeah, David Lawman decided he would rather go with the cheaper crabgrass route, so that's what we're doing on that. And but this, where we're grazing summer cover crops, I think is probably a better fit for any growers that have interest in growing a summer grain crop as well, because once we introduce that crabgrass, um, it is not an easy weed to manage in, you know, milo, and it can be problematic in any of our summer grain crops. But if we have land that is, you know, just going to be grazed, the crabgrass looks pretty good. But if we have land where we might have a summer crop in there every once in a while, we probably want to go with something more tame than crabgrass, like a sorghum sedan or millet or, or a mixture of, of whatever you'd like. And we, we see a lot of guys trying that. Um, we, we have a lot of data, and you people have heard me talk about this. OSU's got data going back 20 years looking at summer cover crops in a continuous uh, wheat for grain rotation. And what we see is we generally, um, if we have an impact, we, we generally don't have a bump in wheat yield performance. Um, we can have some dinks on the yield if, if we, if we, uh, um, uh, if we plant a lot of grass in that summer cover, and that's mostly a nitrogen problem. Um, but we don't, we don't see a lot of benefit in the wheat grain crop. Um, this, this, the challenge, and I think the reason we don't, is that we intensify the rotation, but we don't really improve the diversity. We're still growing continuous monoculture wheat. We're just plant, we're just growing another crop in the summertime, and so we're not getting out of wheat. And we, we've done a lot of this work without grazing, and we don't see a lot of benefits in weed pressure reduction, things like that, because we're still growing continuous wheat. But at the same time, if we are forward, if we're interested in the forage, and keeping the ground covered and keeping roots growing in the soil, then we can graze that and, in, and potentially increase our forage production. And, and I've got some data on that from Tom Peeper and his crew um, from years ago. But we can, we can increase the forage productivity of that soil, and it's much more easily done under no-till than, than under conventional production because we can um, so, more, so much more quickly get the summer crop established. Um, and that's where we come in with this data here. This, this data was collected oh, back 2005, uh, 2006, 2007 from Alfalfa, Garfield, and Kingfisher counties. And, and this is a fairly nice uh, comparison where we have um, no-till is the light colored bars and then conventional tillage is the dark colored bars. And this um, ESFO is the late September planted um, or no, that should be early September planted. I, I screwed up over here, but that's early September planted forage only production system. And this is the wheat hay yield. And then this is the early September um, forage production with a summer millet crop. And you can see on the, this is hay. So this would be hay harvested at soft dough of the wheat. So in the spring, and you can see that in, in the hay production, in the spring hay production, that millet has very little or no impact on the, the yield. And then you see that um, using a no-till uh, system, you're gonna get slightly higher, if not equal amounts of hay. And then when we look at the fall forage production, this again is the early September dual purpose wheat. This is early September forage only wheat. So the difference between these two is that this one, the cattle are taken off in the um, at first hollow stem. And in this one, the, the cattle are grazed until uh, 
soft dough or the or hay is removed at soft dough and then this is the early September um, uh, uh, millet rotation so these bars are lower in both the cultivated and no-till because we're growing millet in the summer time and then these are fall forage yields so in the fall we're lo losing some growth in the fall and my observation experience is, is that can be due to moisture stress elevated moisture stress it could also be um, in this scenario due to uh, a nitrogen stress where you cut that millet off and these aren't grazed these these plots aren't that millet wasn't grazed it was cut for hay so you do have that nitrogen removal that could be um, it could be uh, causing that lower fall forage but in the spring this this graph over here with the hay shows us that that crop will bounce back and make the same kind of biomass production in the spring but in the fall we do see a, a limitation and then this is late September so this is wheat that's planted closer to what we'd like to see for uh, for grain so it's late September dual purpose wheat and you can see your planting date grossly influences that fall forage production and then this is our millet hay and you can see that the no-till really improves things about uh, 600 pounds more dry matter from the millet hay under no-till versus conventional and this is what and as uh, you know as we see with our grain crop no-till versus conventional stuff the summer crop is really when when we get a lot of bang for a buck from our no-till um, management um, and so that brings us uh, to this slide this is where the first year here in Stillwater where we planted a, a summer forage and run cattle on it. And one of the challenges that I will point out is if we're gonna graze a summer forage and any, any producer that's ever tried to graze sorghum sedan realizes and knows that you must utilize that summer forage pretty fast because it grows really fast and goes to veg or reproductive growth and its quality goes down. And so there's a real challenge to balance the, uh, grazing density and forage availability while maintaining some ground cover and, and crop residue. And so that, that's one thing that I, I have to admit we haven't quite figured out, but, but that's one of the, the concerns and challenges is how to get your stocking rate right and when to release those cattle to optimize gain per day um, and still, still keep residue. But the, my my soil science opinion is the we can do it in a lot of different ways but the key is to keep the ground covered once the cattle come off as best we can um and then here's another um example of, of some things we're seeing this is replacing a double crop with a forage you know we get out past west of i-35 and double crop production can become a little sketchy on the grain side of things um, but we still want, you know, and, and we, and, and but it's the, the lack of double crop challenges us, provides challenges to our crop rotations because we get enough rain to grow something after the wheat crop, but we don't always get enough rain or maybe it gets too hot for that double crop to really do well. Whereas forages, we can plant those and in, instead of a double crop, and we don't have those critical growth stages where we can't have high heat, like in soybeans and, 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 and flowering and pod fill. We have high heat, we'll lose a crop. And milo, we can, we can lose a milo and, and corn crop if we get heat or drought at the wrong time. But with forages, we can grow what we can get with the water we get and then uh, utilize that forage for beef production and then go back to an early, early spring summer crop. And that seems to work out fairly well. And uh, the, the thing I like about what I'm seeing is we have growers that are planting um, summer cover crop slash forages anytime from directly after wheat harvest all the way into August. And, and then in September, they'll move to a cool season uh, type cover crop. And so that gives you a, a very wide planting window. It can with some thought. And again, I'm not an animal scientist, but it does give you a lot of of flexibility on trying to figure out when you're going to need the forage and what kind of animals you're going to put out there and based on what kind of animals you have what kind of quality of forage that you're going to need for those cattle 
and and that's some of the things that I discuss with my animal science friends and we'd want to bring them in for that discussion so I'm just kind of sharing with you what we see and <clears throat> one thing I like from an agronomic and soils perspective is this idea of planting warm season uh, crops or forage crops in August and letting them winter kill and what we are seeing is a fairly good um, response to uh, planting these is doing a pretty good job of controlling volunteer and other uh, grassy weeds that we have in our wheat system down here like rye and cheat and and brome and things like that we plant it in august before those things start to germinate and then its growth chokes them out and then it winter kills and so in this that winter kill helps us save a herbicide application um, and then you can graze it when it's green in the early or in the late uh, summer you know september october or then you can utilize it as fodder in the winter time just like what you do with uh, sorghum stocks so there's i like this we don't have any research on it other than a couple demos that we've got but but it's a pretty interesting program um, and then lastly it brings me to this uh, what i refer to as dynamic rotational grazing and this is not something I came up with. This is what producers are doing out in Harper County. And essentially, they're planting forages in rotation with um, whenever they've got moisture and a, a piece of ground that they've utilized um, that's ready to be planted back to a new crop. And I'll just go through quickly that they may have wheat or triticale or other cool season grasses planted anywhere. I've seen them. You know anywhere from early September all the way through October and then whenever they're ready to be grazed they run cattle on them they graze them down to a residue level that they're happy with pull the cattle and then uh, start thinking about what they can plant next and in that scenario they may plant a warm season forage or cover crop whatever you want to call it um, anywhere from April to May um, all the way through August um, and, and whenever it's ready, they'll turn cattle out on it and, and so on and so forth. And the, the thing I like about this is this is an environment where wheat yields are not overly um, profitable right now. And add to that, a lot of the dockage that we're getting in wheat and continuous wheat, they're getting rid of through this rotation. And then they've got forage year round essentially that they can move animals on and off of as it becomes available. Um, but there are challenges to this. You know, you get in this environment, you get these rapidly growing warm season grasses and you've got to dump a lot of cattle out on these fields. And so water becomes a challenge. So you, before you, you know, embark on some of these things, you need to think about how much water 300 head of cattle on a quarter section of land might require. Cause that's the kind of, or stalkers for instance, and the same thing goes with cows, but you, that, that's some of the stuff I don't get into is how to manage those large stocking rates where you might want to mob graze this material down to utilize it quickly before it goes to, to too far into reproductive stage, pull them off and then plant it again. But that's the kind of stuff they're doing. And I, I thought I'd share it with you. Um, and, and like I've mentioned, they maintain sufficient flexibility in their grazing program to allow for drought induced limitations on forage. And that's why I kind of like it. You know, we were in a meeting yesterday with this uh, grazing cap group, uh, Dan Devlin and Amber came down from K state and we we're discussing, you know, the uncertainty about when we're going to get our rainfall. And um, if, if you look at like our wheat yields, uh, they used to kind of fluctuate over, a few years and then the last few years we've had you know one year it'll be good one year it's a disaster and the next year it'll be good it's it's highly variable and I think if we had data on just fall forage production you'd see the same thing in that some years we have fall forage and the next year we might not um, and, and so this diversification of our cropland forage production kind of helps us deal with that because if we're planting something year-round generally we're going to catch a rain unless we're in a severe drought but even in you know some of our drier years there were periods of time where we'd had enough moisture to grow something uh, although in some places i will admit we didn't have moisture enough to grow anything but but 
I think there's some at least merit to thinking about how we could uh, diversify the forage production on our cropland to more effectively protect us against the variations and uncertainty in our rainfall patterns. Um, so now I'm going to talk more about the stuff I really should be doing and know more about, and that's the grazing impacts on soil and some things that we need to think about when managing residue. Um, it is a fact that no-till can, can um, benefits can be achieved with proper grazing. Um, if we graze under no-till systems, we'll reduce runoff and erosion compared to cult cultivated systems. We're gonna reduce evaporation, and on the whole, that redu reduction in evaporation can increase forage production yields as shown by Dr. Pieper and his group. Um, and it can improve nutrient cycling by converting high carbon residue to nutrient rich excrement, I guess would be the, the uh, easiest way to say that. But when we get these high carbon, you know, crops, cover crops, we can break that down. And I, it was fun at, to go to no-till on the plains yesterday and, and listen to people talk about what they're doing with grazing. And a lot of it we, we don't do in our department because grazing is not what we do on a regular basis outside of wheat. But it, there is a lot of truth to grazing and, and the guys in Georgia have done some work looking at the impact of grazing cover crops in, in rotation with summer crops and, and how it affects the nutrient cycling. And it has to do with, with breaking some of that high carbon residue down and you're releasing it back into the system as excrement, I think. Um, however, excessive grazing can lead to compaction, excessive runoff, rapid soil drying, and, and difficulty in establishing the next crop. This difficulty in establishing the next crop, in my opinion, is, is really the biggest one. And that difficulty results from the compaction, excess runoff, and rapid soil drying. It, where we see a residue, complete residue removal, I'll tell guys, if you overgraze, uh, cropland then try to establish a, another crop after that overgrazing you're gonna have about a day and a half or less to get a crop planted into that after a rainfall because it's gonna rain it'll be too wet and then <clears throat> sometime after it's too wet it'll be just right and that'll be a very short wind window and then it's gonna be too dry especially if you're trying to plant wheat for forage in September where we're still kind of hot, that ground's gonna go from too wet to too dry really fast. And, and that's one of the biggest challenges with not maintaining residue. If we maintain residue, then it'll be too wet for a little while, but that window where it's moist enough to plant, but not so dry it's, um, that we can't get into it, that window extends when we maintain forage and that's what, that's what or maintain ground cover and that's what makes that ground cover so important. And then, you know, all these statements, we've got data and, and I could go through it, but I'm not going to for Nebraska and Georgia and Texas and, and various places. One thing that Texas has done down in Vernon, Texas, is, is a lot of work looking at gain. And, and uh, they don't always find that forage yields are higher under no-till, but they certainly see that gains are better. And that goes back to this, the fact that uh, under no-till, particularly long-term no-till where we're developing good soil strength against the hoof action. Those cattle aren't sinking in so bad and they're not tromping around in the mud. Of course, that was years ago when they did that research. In the most recent years, uh, we generally haven't been so wet that we had a lot of problem with mud. Um, and that's one of the challenges with any of the work I've done is most of it was done during periods where we didn't have a lot of rain. Um, one question that always comes up is, is uh, how much residue do we really need? The NRCS, you know, at one time they said we could graze cover crops um, as long as we maintain 4,000 pounds residue. And, and now recently talking to our state agronomists, they're, they're moving that to 3,000 pounds. And I, I put question marks because I really don't know. I myself, my experience tells me that if I'm going to grow a summer grain crop like milo or soybeans or corn, I want as much residue as I can move out of the way to get the seed in the ground. And so, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight thousand pounds of residue on a summer or on the soil surface prior to planting a uh, summer crop is, is better. Now, 
small grain fall forage production. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily true. My experience has been is that if I have heavy amounts of high carbon residue on the soil surface, I'm either going to need to fertilize more and or plant much earlier with my summer or with my cool season small grain um, to get in and get through that residue. And those are things that we can do to overcome the high residue. But if, if we're gonna go into high residue um, rotations with uh, cool season forages, we're gonna have to make some adjust adjustments. Um, but there certainly is a minimum. I, I, my, when I work with animal science, Dr. Lawman's crew, I, I ask them, they can graze it right up until they're about to start causing bare ground. And, I, and they can take quite a little bit with the crabgrass deal and still maintain a very nice mat of, of cover. And I'll show some pictures of that. But we've got to have nearly 100% ground cover. 80 to 100% ground cover is ideal. Um, and well, the reason is if we take it slick clean and graze it to bare ground, th then this is what will definitely happen. This is some data from what I, when I first started working here, we we're taking soil samples for, for some projects. And we go out to Western Oklahoma to this uh, uh, graze out field. And all, uh, we had a couple different graze outs. Over here, we, we looked at soil moisture on graze out where it was bare ground and then we, where we looked at graze out, um, but we still had some wheat stubble and it, it had been sprayed right after the cattle come off. And then we look at graze out where there was crabgrass um, when we sampled. And then this is the wilting point of the Nord silt loam from the soil survey. And so you can see where we graze out and then kill the field and, and keep it clean. We have uh, a pretty good amount of moisture in here. And then where we graze out with bare ground is just as dry as, as the area. And this is bare ground that really didn't have anything growing on it. And this is in July. And that's got um, just slightly more, it's got um, actually less moisture at depth than where we had crabgrass. And then there it's just only slightly more moist than what the permanent wilting point of that profile. And so this condition, if we graze out multiple years to bare ground, we will create or have the opportunity to create very uh, dense compaction in the top four inches that will grossly influence our ability to take water into that profile because this, I'll point out the crabgrass field is dry because there's crabgrass growing on it and it's taking all the water out of the ground. The, this this uh, graze out bare ground, which is where this core was taken, that is dry because water will not go through the soil surface into the subsoil. It just sheets off and runs off and goes down the terrace channels into the creek. And, and so we, have a, we can cause severe problems if we take too much. And this is just a picture of that uh, wheat stubble field. And then this is the crabgrass field where the crabgrass um, sample was taken. Um, <clears throat> this year, we, we did, like I say, make some effort to look at the influence of residue on for, fall forage yield. And so this data comes from where we had different cutting heights on, on our forage, our, our crabgrass forage. And what we see is that as we increase our residue amount, we didn't really see a significant increase in, or decrease in forage yield. The fact that that R squared is 0 0.02 tells me that residue did not influence fall forage yield, which is good. Um, here's another graphic of it. We cut the, the crabgrass at two inches from the ground, four inches from the ground, eight inches from the ground, or we didn't clip it at all. and um, you can see the yellow bar is the residue mass that we collected on December 1st along with the forage. So we see an increase in forage mass as we clip it at higher and higher light heights. And then although this eight inch height is slightly higher forage yield, it's certainly not significantly different than 1400 pounds. But um, the long and short of it is this one year of data tells us that the, the forage clipping height and density didn't have an effect on forage productivity. Um, and here's some fun pictures. This on the left-hand picture, actually both of these pictures were taken right before the ice storm. So we'd went since probably the middle of October with little or no significant rain. And then we're running cattle on here 
and they've grazed it down pretty good. And you can see we're still doing well with some regrowth, but this regrowth prior to that ice storm was starting to really um, become drought stressed. The reason I show this is that this is grazed wheat cropland and they're eating the wheat and they're leaving the residue on the surface and they're not really messing with that. Now, these cattle are supplemented with hay, so they don't really have any reason to want to eat dried dead uh, uh, residue. Uh, I don't know what would happen if you put a bunch of cattle out here with no hay or any roughage and they were just eating high quality or high protein wheat. I don't know if they'd eat that, that residue or not. But long and short, in this particular year, in this particular system, they are really not disturbing a lot of that residue. And then this was taken, <clears throat> I was almost late for this webinar and, uh, earlier, um, and the reason why I was out taking pictures of this picture was taken today and in the generally the same area. You can see that that wheat's starting to rebound and grow with these warm temperatures and the nice rainfall we got from the ice storm, and we still have a nice amount of residue in between it. But I also want to point out these areas where we have bare ground. This soil is an alluvial soil, so it's got a tremendous amount of variation. We have anything out there from a nice loam to a very fine sandy loam. And in, so that allows us to look at these management strategies or this management and how it change, how it responds to different soil types. And I wanted to show you here, this is a, a more loamy area of the soil. So this is very good soil and we have very good wheat and you can see there's no residue. That residue hadn't been eaten since we planted it. There was no residue when we planted. So because this is a high traffic area um, or you know an area just where the crabgrass didn't do very well last year. But we do have a pretty good stand of wheat here. So you can, in some soil types, you can beat up more than others, I guess is the moral of the story. And in this scenario, we have a soil where we had very limited residue at planting. We still have limited residue now, but we're still doing okay on the wheat. In contrast, this over here is a, it's got a lot of very fine sand in it. And as I mentioned earlier, we started this after graze out and we grazed, I mean, we've been grazing this ever since it was last cultivated pretty heavily. And in this soil, this very fine sandy material, we do have um, some problems with our wheat production. It's hard to get it out of the ground and what we can get out of the ground is going to be more prone to drought stress. Uh, again, we got about two inches of rain on this from that uh, ice storm and these plants in this area are already drought stressed. The good thing is, is in this field, that represents on 90 acres, probably a half acre worth of, of surface area. So it's very low acreage on this field. But if you have these kind of soils, you know, and right here where we have residue, it's probably very similar soil, but where we have residue, those plants look pretty healthy. But for whatever reason, this area is limited on its residue and those, those plants are, are, are uh, struggling. And so with that, uh, I'll summarize, uh, grazing is a good way to offset costs of cover crops, um, certainly. Um, cropland grazing rotations are a good way to diversify uh, when, we, when grain crops don't pencil out. And I, you know, I'm not telling you that we should just start grazing all our cropland because when, when grain crops pencil out, they can pencil out very well. But I think uh, when, when we are in environments or in market uh, conditions where grain crops don't pencil out and, and, and beef gain does, I think it's something to consider. And because of very diverse options, it will take a while to nail down the details. That's one thing. In the Southern Plains, we are very fortunate that we can grow almost anything. But because of the uh, weather patterns, it's hard to figure out what we should grow. And, and, and with the grazing, you have different, uh, you know, calving dates and all these different ways to manage beef cattle. And now we're trying to incorporate this uh, cropland grazing to it. And there's so many ways to do it. It's hard to, to break down some details. Um, but I think we have a great number of data coming online and tools in the pipeline that's going to help us as we proceed. As a result, and again, this is some stuff we we're talking about yesterday in this meeting in Stillwater, where there's a lot of things coming out of this grazing cap that I think that will help us as we proceed in this endeavor. And with that, 
I just um, put a plug in for our no-till conference on March 7th and 8th. And if you're interested in uh, getting a newsletter from our uh, plant soil science department, if you're in Oklahoma, you can talk to your county educator, or if you're outside Oklahoma, you can just contact me. And then uh, I always like to give a plug to Brian Arnall and his Enrich strips. And there's the website for that. But I'll take any questions, Amber, now, I guess. Okay, thanks, Jason. Um, so for those of you who hadn't joined us yet at the very beginning, there is a chat function at the bottom of your webinar screen, and you can use that to chat your questions. Um, we'll just hang out for here for a little bit and see if anybody has anything they would like to ask. So Jason, I do have a question, and this is potentially Background for everyone else. I'm not an agronomist. I'm not a livestock person. I'm an anthropologist, so I have random weird questions about these sorts of things. I noticed most of those are, um, at least most of the stars I noticed on your map were on the western side of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. What is the reason for why, I mean, is it just that you know more about what's happening there? Or are people not grazing covers in eastern Oklahoma, and what's the reason? Well, it's partly because a lot of the interest that I get, like we have, we have an on-farm demonstration uh, project funded by Conservation Innovation Grant, and most of the activity in that and interest on cover crops was in the from our county people, for like educators and conservation districts. Those people interested in, in cover crops were in o Western Oklahoma, and then the western part of the state is where our, all our wheat is, and so that's where. Uh, that that's the highest concentration of producers who are accustomed to grazing cropland are the guys in the east because they have higher yield potentials um, there's still guys that'll, that'll graze wheat but not as often and they're going to be growing grain uh, summer grain crops like corn and soybeans or milo and that's just the history that they can grow their history is that that they they grow more summer grain crops and so very fewer of the farmers in, e in eastern Oklahoma have cattle than in western Oklahoma. Most all of them in western Oklahoma have cattle. And there, I'm not saying there are none in eastern Oklahoma. I'm just saying there's not as many. There are more, there are more cattlemen by number of cattlemen in eastern Oklahoma, but most of them are running perennial forage-based systems. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. And and I hate to generalize, but that's, you know, we have, you know, up in e eastern Oklahoma, we're doing some stuff with cool season cover crops and soybean corn rotation. And the guys I'm working with, I don't think they have cattle, but they are surrounded by cattlemen. Uh, you know what I mean? And But they themselves don't run cattle. And because they're not accustomed to running cattle on cropland, they're more apprehensive about putting cattle out on their cropland. Gotcha. Um, so we do have a question in from someone besides me. Um, this one is, how about row spacing? 10 versus seven and a half. Um, I assume there's a, what sort of impacts do you see in terms of forage production and yield differences between those? Oh, I might, I haven't seen data generated on that in a long time i will tell you you know we have grow we have very few growers that that grow uh, dual purpose wheat that have 10 inch drills most of them have seven and a half or, or narrow row spacing and you know i and that that's most likely due to years and years ago they they did work to look at row spacing and saw that that dual purpose wheat forage production was optimized by narrow rows. Now, you can, I have a couple growers that have 10 inch drills and they have 10 inch drills because they're primarily grain crop farmers, but they do own cattle. And they'll tell me that they don't really observe that much of a, a loss in forage, um, but that's their anecdotal biased opinion because they got a 10 inch drill. I, I uh, it kind it kind of depends on what you're wanting to do, in my opinion, if, because the, the narrow row spacing just is going to get you to, to more rapid um, uh, canopy cover, and, and that's what you want. You, 
on fall forage, you want the canopy to cut, uh, close and it to grow. And, you know, we plant on that dual purpose, and this is some of the details I didn't get into, but on a grain crop, you know, 60, 70, 80 pounds of seed. But OSU, we recommend two bushel, 120 pounds is optimum seeding rate for dual purpose and, or grazing wheat. So there's a lot of differences between um, these things. And that, you know, even when you start looking at the cover crops, we, we see some guys looking at low seeding rates to minimize costs for cover crop implementation. But if you're gonna use it for forage, you're gonna to wanna to reevaluate that because if you're wanting tonnage or beef gain, then you're probably gonna to wanna to manage it more like a forage crop um, if, if that's what you want.